as someone who uh, is a journalist, I've had to turn off the notifications on. Yeah, I'm going to start, I'm going to talk as a journalist um, who works in these areas, who works with data with, with various news organisations. Um, and also as an academic who teaches this and, and researches this. And, and I'm going to uh, talk about data and action. That's, that's kind of the, the hook of this talk. And like any good uh, academic or any bad journalist, I've stolen this from uh, Jeffrey Barrett, from a researcher, uh, who said that a couple of years ago, and this really stuck in my head, um, basically that we're moving from this era where knowledge is power to an era where data is action. Um, and uh, the key point that he makes there is that all it needs is data with preferred outcomes. So once we've decided on the outcomes that we want, we can automatically, um, if you like, create those outcomes, or at least try to create those outcomes through a data input. There's no need for uh, an intermediary step. So I'm going to look, uh, look at this in a couple of ways. I'm going to talk about uh, what both preferred outcomes are for journalism and data journalism in particular, what we actually want from journalism over the next 10 years, and also how this data power nexus um, has implications for journalism itself and, and journalism's role within society. So as, as society moves towards this data, action nexus, um, what is the role of journalism within that. And I'm going to, to do this, I'm going to use, um, I'm going to go to two places. I'm going to go to what I call Shangri-La, the promised land of data journalism, and data dystopia, the, the kind of dark side of data journalism. And along the way, it's going to talk about uh, power, corruption, and lies, but particularly power. So we'll start with Shangri-La, okay? the promised land of data journalism. And to do that, I want to start with um, Kovacs and Rosenstiel's 10 principles of uh, journalism, 10 elements of journalism. These are the, the normative values of journalism that, that we aspire to, in theory at least, as journalists. And a lot of this is about power. It's about uh, journalism's relationship with power, its need to be independent of power, but also journalism's role in a subservient way to citizens. Um, so I'm going to go through these in terms of how they relate to data journalism in particular. And first of all, I want to talk about independence. So we talk about independence from power uh, and from sources journalism, but obviously in data journalism, I think it's important to look at how independent we are from the data itself. Some years ago, I warned against the potential for data journalism, the idea that we would be supplied with data as journalists, and we would merely reproduce that without necessarily scrutinising it. Uh, and there's lots of examples of that. In fact, recently, I saw this article uh, in the Independent, which recently stopped uh, its print edition, talking about uh, something that's probably close to the hearts of many people here, plagiarism, and this striking statistic, half of university students are losing marks. And I thought that was quite odd, how can you say that you're losing marks? Um, and this is based on a survey there by a plagiarism detection software company, so they have a vested interest in this. There's no indication how they selected the respondents. There's no indication what questions they actually asked and how it was uh, framed. There's all sorts of problems with this. What they've just taken is a survey. Very common PR technique for getting coverage. Likewise, government <coughs> ministers making statements uh, about the effects and the uh, effectiveness of their policies, quite often recycled. Recently, David Cameron the UK Prime Minister said that uh, more young black men go to prison than in university. It's not true at all. It's not true in the US either, where that claim's also been made. And in the UK, the statistics watchdog has, has been regularly wrapping 
the knuckles uh, kind of telling off politicians for misusing statistics. In welfare, Prime Minister, and health as well. And I think open data presents a, a, not just an opportunity for journalism, but a problem for journalism, which is that if we have easy access to data, then it takes away to some extent the need to make difficult choices about prioritising uh, efforts. Um, I spoke to um, one particular journalist a, a few years ago who was saying that in Sweden, because the uh, access to information laws are so well established, um, to some extent, journalists, she felt, were you know, not working as hard as they could be to access other sorts of data. They, if you like, were giving that data on a plate. And I, and I see that with freedom of information requests and open data, this kind of um, reliance on what's already there rather than looking for new sources. And I think if you have to uh, think more carefully about an allocation of resources, then you make more informed choices. So there's an interesting question to be asked about what choices we're making in terms of the data that we access as journalists, why those choices are made, to what extent we go for easy accessible forms of data and to what extent we look for others. The film Spotlight has a brilliant 20 minute section right in the middle of the film, um, which is just, a, you know, just data journalism <laughs> form, basically. It's, uh, compiling data from paper, uh, almanacs of um, uh, priests' uh, locations in, uh, I'm trying to think if it was Chicago. It's not Chicago, it's not Boston. Boston, that was it, thank you. You know, and that was a decision that had, that was a careful decision that was going to take a lot more time. Likewise, scraping, I know from personal experience, when you make a decision to scrape, a data source, then that involves investing time in programming and, and solving problems and so on and maintenance. So you have to choose carefully whether you're going to do that. There's a useful analogy here with body-worn cameras. Uh, body-worn cameras in the police force offer a superficial, if you like, um, transparency in the police force. But we have to remember who has the power in this situation, and that is the police. One piece of research into, um, I think it was Las Vegas, let me just check. Oh, oh no. In New Orleans it was. Um, in terms of uh, when cameras are actually turned on, most of the time when police use force, the cameras are either turned off or the footage was uh, no longer available for whatever reason. And there's a, there's a question here as well about news values and whether news values are changed in response to open data. There's all sorts of problems with open data in terms of their newsworthiness. Uh, Jonathan Stoneman looked at uh, the open data initiatives around the world and he found that journalism was not mentioned in any of those initiatives. Instead, the focus in terms of open data initiatives has been on efficiency, stimulating business and science, uh, and public participation. You might argue that the media is being cut out of the conversation through open data initiatives, this idea of armchair auditors who will scrutinise the government instead of uh, journalists and news organisations who you might argue have more access and uh, more power, again, to get answers. St. Barton University's Mark Frank points out that success in open data initiatives is typically measured by volume, the amount of data that's published. Um, many writers, he says, strongly resist the idea that government should select or interpret the data. It's not surprising that the result is mostly input transparency. Input data is on the whole easier to obtain and publish than output or outcome data. It's easier to track how much you have spent on teachers than the number of lessons they have taught or how well educated children are as a result. Now he says there's signs that this is changing. The national information infrastructure in the UK is a government in the initiative to select data sets based on users' needs that are key to the nation and demands special attention. 
but the passive transparency model remains dominant, and while it does, open data is unlikely to have a significant political impact. So there's an issue with uh, political expediency and news expediency, and I'm curious to see what happens as a result. One particularly good example of this I want to show you is a brief <coughs> video by um, Ellen Miller. The directive is only as strong as its enforcement. To be sure, there have been some meaningful first steps from agencies in the White House. Certainly HHS and NASA both immediately come to mind as aggressively producing uh, new projects that are on the cutting edge. The White House itself has taken some meaningful steps in posting its staffers' ethics filings online, requiring extensive stimulus lobbying disclosure and White House visitor logs online. This is unique and the first time any administration has ever done it. But these are not well-established policies. There are uh, exemptions to this data. We do not know. Uh, we don't have any information about what the exemptions are. And all of the initiatives need a steady hand and a clear commitment to mature into a permanent, reliable, and effective policy. And one central Obama campaign promise, the very first one that you see here, quote unquote, to create a central internet database of lobbying reports, ethics records, and campaign finance filings are not even on the drawing boards. Data.gov started with enormous promise. A single catalog for all government data is a very exciting concept. As it's evolved, however, we have gotten a website and a more attractive design and somewhat improved organization for the data sets. But it's still pretty mediocre as a data repository and the types of data that are available remain an enormous concern. It turns out, for example, that the government has some pretty interesting ideas about what they regard as high value data. The Department of Interior seems to think that the population count of wild horses and burrows is high value but records of safety violations, like the ones that seem to have led to the upper branch mine disaster, are not. We want to see data that can be used to hold government and the entities that report to it accountable. Records and data that would allow people to assess the effectiveness and the efficiency of federal programs, policies, and initiatives, and the competence and integrity of employees and contractors, and the management of public resources. Recovery.gov, the government's signature project to demonstrate transparency around economic stimulus spending, is little more than a qualified success. The idea of collecting job information at the most local level was extremely, overly indeed optimistic, and ended with the vice president making excuses for the data's poor quality on the Daily Show. Now, that's the uh, Sunlight Foundation. And it's one of the um, few examples where journalism is actually campaigning for open data. In fact, the, the only example I can find elsewhere is from 2006, uh, where Michael Cross and Charles Arthur, the Guardian, campaigned to free our data. And this is geographical data, in particular mapping data. Uh, the voices in support of freedom of information have been much louder in <coughs> And again, I think there are questions to be asked about why it is that news organisations don't campaign uh, more strongly on open data. Is it because there's a potential conflict of interest where data is available to everyone, whereas freedom of information at least offers the journalists first dibs on that information? Jonathan Stallman again argues that if open data is not publicised in the mass media and journalists do not press the release of open data they can use, it is difficult to see open data breaking into public consciousness. So moving on to a number of Kovach and Rosen Steele's principles, uh, I want to also look at how data gives the voice of the voiceless. And I think there are three different ways that we can look at this. We can look at who has a voice in the data that is released, how is that data used as a proxy for the voiceless, and how is data used to amplify voices. Um, I have a particular interest here in articles, data journalism that 
gives advice to the literally voiceless, the dead, the Bureau of Investigative Journalism have an ongoing cross, uh, a project called uh, Naming the Dead, which compiles from various news reports and other reports the names of people, or even anonymous people, that have been killed in drone attacks. So they are able to have a, an overall figure and details uh, on whether people are citizens or accused um, terrorists and so on. And that data has been really valuable. It's been used by NGOs uh, around the world in trying to establish the scale of uh, deaths in military conflict and drone attacks. And it's a very simple process. It's, it's not a technical process. It is simply, literally, monitoring media reports and converting that into structured data. Nicholas Kaiser Brill, who will be speaking uh, later in this conference, is, is a really good example of this as well with uh, the migrants' files. A similar sort of example of actually trying to put figures to deaths that are otherwise voiceless. The WikiLeaks, uh, Iraq logs, and the Afghanistan war logs are another example of this, identifying 15,000 civilian deaths that had previously been uncounted. These were literally voiceless people. Uh, but there are problems with that which I'll come on to. And more recently, The Guardian have been one of a number of news outlets to try to put a figure to um, people killed by police in shootings in the United States. In some ways, the dead are easy to count, uh, certainly easier than other voiceless people. But we've seen other data journalism initiatives give a voice to marginalised groups or amplify that voice where there are misconceptions and myths. So, for example, people who claim welfare, massively underrepresented in the news. Uh, people in religious and ethnic minorities. And I think this is a really interesting use of data. Uh, traditionally, you know, we would uh, interview a politician and a politician might be able to give us some statistics. And then to counter that, we might have a case study, someone who has suffered as a result of those policies. But ultimately, that person doesn't have access to the same statistics. They don't have the same voice as the politician or someone else. Um, but using data, we're able to amplify and strengthen those voices. One of the things I often say to my students is that a good story should have two elements. It should tell us why we should care and why this matters. Like the anecdote, the case study, that tells us why we should care. That gives us a human aspect to that story. But without data, it's just an anecdote. The data tells us why this matters. But without an anecdote, that data is merely statistics. The third element I want to talk about in terms of Shangri-La is the idea of speaking uh, truth to power. Um, and this is a, a common kind of theme in uh, journalism, and particularly data journalism. But we need to remember that data journalism is not investigative journalism. And indeed, investigative journalism isn't always what we uh, paint it to be. You know, we tell, a, we tell a story about investigative journalism and journalism generally that is not necessarily completely reflective of the truth. Investigative journalism is a marketing device, it's a branding exercise just as much as it is a piece of public service. We have to remember how investigative journalism is used commercially and why, in some cases, these organisations invest in it. Not all investigative journalism is in the public interest unless you want to argue about definitions. And certainly data journalism is not all great in public service. There's lots of terrible data journalism as well. What's happening, I think, with data journalism, as with investigative journalism and journalism generally at the moment, is just as in the last 10 years we've had a defense of journalism, people trying to argue that their journalism is different to blogging, their journalism is different to citizen journalism, these horrible egotistical arguments about, I'm much more worthy than you, I'm a member of the high priesthood. Um, and that's happening with data journalism as well. And we're starting to get people trying to impose definitions on data journalism. Simon Rogers, who will be speaking, is it tomorrow, I think? Yes. Um, uh, bless him, I love him, but he's tried to impose his own definition uh, recently, which was last month. So he says that data journalism 
is only using data to tell stories in the best possible way, combining the best techniques of journalism, including visualizations, concise explanation, and the latest technology. It should be open, accessible, and enlightened. All admirable ambitions, but good luck to your sign. I, no, I, <laughs> I don't think that's what's going to happen. So, if we really want to look at speaking truth to power, we need to move to data dystopia, we need to leave Shangri-La behind. And specifically, these coordinates, these are the coordinates of data dystopia, and this is what you'll find there, a broken <laughs> toilet in the middle of a driveway. This is Joyce Taylor's farm in Kansas. Um, and why has she got a broken toilet? Why has someone left that in her driveway? We don't know. For about the last 10 years, Joyce Taylor has been visited by FBI agents, federal marshals, tax collectors, ambulances searching for suicidal veterans, police officers searching for runaway children. She and the people renting uh, rooms in her farm have been accused of being identity thieves, spammers, fraudsters, They've been named online and information shared about them. They found people scranging around in their barn, and of course, someone left a broken toilet in their driveway. Um, this is because the precise center of the United States is around this area. And a company called MaxMind, which is used to locate IP addresses, um, when it was decided to identify the middle of uh, the US, it rendered it to 38 degrees north, 97 degrees west, which is the location of Joyce's farm. So when FBI agents are looking for people who've hidden their identity, uh, MaxMind locates them in the precise center of the United States, which happens to be Joyce's farm. And this comes into play on more than one occasion. So here's a map showing poll consumption of uh, Democratic states and Republican states in the US, released by Pornhub. So we see that basically uh, Republican states apparently consume a lot more porn than others. And here's Kansas, which is a complete outlier because if you are hiding your identity on the internet uh, and you're using some server that's based in the US, you will be located physically in Kansas. So it's not that Kansas is a complete reprobate uh, state that's just spending all its time consuming porn. This is an anomaly of uh, mapping. Here's another example. This is a, a map of running data in New York, where people are running and using you know, one of these fitness apps to share their location. And this was the map that was drawn with it by running data. It has three problems. Seasonal bias, location fuzziness, and tagging bias. So these are all identified by Margaret McKenna. So the seasonal bias is that when this data is taken from, it comes from uh, November, when there's a lot of marathons, so the marathons are stupid data, but also it's cold. So people run in different locations in November to other parts of the year when it might be warm. The location fuzziness is how do you uh, identify a point where a run takes place? Is it the start point? Is it the end point? Is it some sort of average of all the GPS points? How accurate are they? And finally, tagging bias. Uh, this is only publicly tagged running groups. That's about 10% of all uh, running used in this app. Now, when people tag running groups as public, there might be certain qualities at play, so it might be a particularly scenic route rather than an industrial uh, or less pretty route. It might be a particular time of day. It might be safer places rather than places where people feel more vulnerable in sharing their location data. So it's a map that doesn't reflect reality, it reflects what people are willing to share during a particular time and based on the limitations of the software. These sorts of examples strike fear into um, <coughs> journalists, which I think is really interesting because you know we don't not ask questions of politicians because we're afraid that they're going to lie to us. We don't <coughs> not ask questions of police officers in case they get angry with us. We ask, you know, those 
we might be scared, but we still have to do it as journalists. And it's interesting, I see a lot of journalists do data journalism training, and they'll do it in the training room, but they still hesitate to do it in the real world because they're afraid of this, this kind of failure, this different type of failure. I was talking to a sports journalist recently about a data project that we're working on. I asked how many uh, of the journalists that were going to be working on this were able to read accounts of football clubs. And he said, basically, they're not accountants. And I said, no, you know, they're journalists. So how many of them can read accounts of football clubs? And he admitted that he himself would not be confident reporting on accounts. Now, if you look at how many football clubs have gone into administration and had financial problems in the last 20 years, it's about half of the football league. It's more than 40 clubs over 20 years. So that's more than one a year. That basically means that a football club having financial problems is a more regular sporting event than the FA Cup final. And yet, sports journalists don't prepare for this. They, they don't seem to see it as part of their calendar, part of their role. Why are they afraid? Why are they not confident of doing this? Data journalists get things wrong. Now I've said it, there it is. Here's Monica Chalabi, for example. She worked for The Guardian in 538, and she's back at The Guardian again. But she still made this horrible mistake in mapping kidnappings in Nigeria. This is the 538. Um, you might be able to see the problem here. And it might look familiar. So uh, she created this animated map of kidnappings over time. And she used something called the Global Database of Events, Language and Talk. But this is a database of media reports, not events. So what she was mapping was not the kidnappings, but the media reports of the kidnappings. That's problem number one. The second problem is that where no location is given, it will be placed in the middle of Nigeria. So here we have the big red map again, coming back to these uh, mapping issues. Um, I think we really need more work, more research into how often these mistakes happen, what types of mistakes they are. Is it all um, the centre of Kansas and the centre of Nigeria? And whether or not it happens more often in data journalism or less often than in standard journalism. You know, in standard journalism, people tell lies to us, which we report. In standard journalism, we make mistakes in that reporting. Sometimes the mistake is the source, sometimes it's the journalist. Uh, as one person put it, I love this quote from Neil McIntosh of the Wall Street Journal. Right. Because people are so afraid, he says it's like sex at the university, who talks about it, few do it. Few are still doing that. <laughs> Jake Harris, one of the data journalists, gives us a useful starting point with eight potential areas where we can get things wrong with data journalists. That might be acquiring the data itself, cleaning it, loading it, verifying it, analysing it, cherry picking presenting it, and the maintenance of data, which I'll come back to later as well. So these are all areas we can start to look at in terms of um, what processes are in place, what mistakes are made, and how that compares to traditional journalism. Again, data journalism is not university journalism. Data is not true. Why do we hang on to this uh, fear? I think this is a basis of this fear, that we think that because of this data, that it must be true. And if we present it as data journalism, we must um, have access to the truth, we must be doing it properly. So again, we're coming back to this data action nexus. On a related note, there's bad data. I love bad data stories. I mean, mm -hmm. This is one of the most important elements of data journalism, not the data, not the good data, but actually identifying the bad data, because data is a source of power. Data is where action happens. So here, for example, is some data from uh, The Intercept uh, on drones again. At uh, one point, nine out of ten people being killed by drones were the wrong people. In Yemen and Somalia, where the US has found all limited intelligence capabilities, they write, uh, the equivalent ratios may well be much worse. 
This is about bad data, it's about a lack of data. There's also an issue with data which um, is incorrect. So uh, Goodhart's law says that when a measure becomes a target, it ceases to become a good measure. And those are the measures I think that we should be focusing on as data journalists, but the data that is leading to action directly, and which as a result is most susceptible to being manipulated. The Bureau of Investigative Journalism a few years ago looked at deaths in police custody, a really good example of this. What they did, again, very simple process, not a technical one, was look at media reports of deaths in police custody and see were they reflected in official statistics about deaths in police custody. And they weren't, because the official definition of death and the official definition of police custody is so narrow as to exclude most things that any reasonable human being would think was the death of police custody. Um, Recently, we've seen attempts to change the uh, definition of child poverty, for example. Um, I was reading uh, on the plane on the way over about the, the proposals to change the measurement of how wealth is passed on from generation to generation, so kind of inheritance, trusts, things like that. Those are really significant changes. I think Nicholas is going to talk a little bit more about this as well. Um, Benford's law is a really useful technique here. This is uh, Benford's law is a statistical technique to look for indications of uh, manipulation, fraud. So it's used in accounting to look for potentially fraudulent accounts to try and identify them. It's not evidence of fraud, but it's an indication, it's a way of focusing where you look. So one uh, blogger in Mexico looked at uh, homicides, drug-related homicides, and he looked at the UN statistics and the uh, Mexican police statistics. And he found that both of those statistics varied from Benefit's law. In other words, there was evidence of manipulation, human manipulation. And again, he looked at media reports that weren't in the official reports. Benefit's law, by the way, shows Greece's economy diverting from Benefit's law in the lead up to the crash, it shows the dot com bubble, the technology sector, sector diverging from Benford's law as well. <clears throat> Predictive policing is a really good candidate for this, so we're moving on to algorithms now. Uh, in New York, Lutz Finger looked at the data on stop and search based on predicted algorithms by a company called Hunchlab. He found that neighbourhoods with the greatest racial disparity between the race of people stopped and the makeup of the residents were predominantly white neighbourhoods. In other words, more black people were stopped and searched in white neighbourhoods uh, than anywhere else. And he suggested two possible factors for this. Firstly, the human element, officers um, choosing who to stop despite the algorithm, and the machine, and the idea that racism essentially <coughs> was baked into the code because it was based on previous stop and search data. Sometimes good journalism is about opening that data, <coughs> that data up to scrutiny. So the Texas Tribune, for example, <coughs> um, published data on arrests and realised that many of the codes, the crime codes, were wrong. Uh, one woman who husband was listed on the public register as being a child molester incorrectly. It was one of about 300 people incorrectly labelled with that crime code because no one was second checking that data in the justice system in Texas. So their publication of that data led to a correction and a change in the system itself. <clears throat> so it's not just about the journalistic principle of accuracy, it's sometimes about the interaction with a community in terms of finding problems with poor data hygiene. And again, we're going to come back to this in terms of transparency. <clears throat> then we've got statistics. Again, one of my favourite quotes. Statistics are like a big key need. What they reveal is suggestive, but what they conceal is vital, as Professor Aaron Liebenstein had it. So we all know about dodgy correlations. This is one of my favourite sites. Spurious correlations are one of my favourite correlations. I'm sure there's something in this. 
Um, <laughs> oh, it's basically Bloomberg is dismounting range, affecting the murder rate in New York State. <laughs> and of course, XKCD always has a cartoon face. <coughs> There's the punchline. With big data, we have a new level of correlation problem called the multiple comparisons problem. In other words, given enough data points, we can find a correlation between anything, which is essentially what spurious correlations does. With big data, we have more opportunities for uh, mistaken correlations. And again, here's another cartoon about that. Google flu trends is one of the best examples of this. In 2008, they beat the Census for Disease Control and Prevention in predicting the spread of flu based on 50 million search queries. But five years later, in February 2013, Nature News found that uh, Google flu trends had overestimated the spread of flu consistently ever since. Basically, Google flu trends had identified correlation, but not what had caused it. Um, in a paper called The Parable of Google Flu, Traps in Big Data Analysis, David Laser, Ryan Kennedy, Gary King, and Alessandro Vespinciani explored two main issues, big data hubris and algorithm dynamics. The first is the challenge of analyzing the data the second is the problem of tweaks made to the algorithm, both by programs and by users. So we have a problem with big data, again, that we need to address as journalists and as academics. And we have a problem with availability. Uh, big data is now contained, collected by big organisations. Twitter encapsulates this. In its early days, its API was completely open, anyone could build anything with it. Now it's closed off the fire holes of full data, extremely expensive, and most people cannot access it. It's not only a challenge of access, but it's a challenge of power. Big data now rivals traditional academic centres of knowledge and government collection of data. Now, government is democratically accountable. You could argue that uh, academic data is independent. And you can add journalism to that as a source of independent knowledge, which is basically challenges from the claims of big data, the authoritative claims of big data. David Bray has this phrase about big data lacking the regulating force of philosophy. So again, there's no uh, intermediary step between the data and the action. There's no philosophy in between those two, as you might get in academic research or government. We also have gaps in data. This is a diagram by a World War II mathematician, Abraham Wald. He was given data on uh, bullet holes in planes that had flown over uh, Europe. And uh, he was asked where they should strengthen the planes. They couldn't strengthen the whole of the plane because it would be too heavy to fly. So he said, we should strengthen this bit here on the wings, where there's no bullet holes. Why? Because that was the data that he didn't have. The data that he had was the planes that came back. And the bullet holes were just distributed all over the place, apart from there. So what he concluded was the planes that didn't come back were probably shot on those gaps on the wings. So it's about what data we're lacking as much as what data we have. <coughs> so which is it to be? Data dystopia or Shangri-La? <laughs> Um, I'm less interested in the destinations and more in the routes that we're going to take to get there. <coughs> One of Kovac and Rose's <coughs> principles for journalism is to make this interesting, uh, significant, and interesting and relevant. The data journalism is often data visualisation and basically telling stories. And there's plenty of metrics to support the use of visualisation in journalism. In fact, it's one of the most exciting things to think about modern era of journalism is that we have different ways of telling stories visually to a whole new audience 
that isn't a textual audience like we are. So we know that visualizations have a longer shelf life. This yellow peak in the text article, a visual version of the same story, has a much longer recurring uh, traffic. At Trinity Mirrors editorial conference <coughs> uh, a couple of years ago, one of the editors said that having a simple database on a page increases the amount of time someone spends on that page by a third. We know it's the single biggest factor in tweets being retweeted. We know it has a big impact on Facebook posts being seen. <coughs> it can also be used in a really innovative way to overcome the problem of big abstract numbers. Um, one quote uh, attributed wrongly to Stalin is that the death of one man is a tragedy, but the death of a million is a statistic. Um, and this is something that, that is very true in data journalism. If you're reporting about big numbers, it's, it's meaningless. We need to make it meaningful. And there's some research that this has a real impact in, uh, not just in journalism, but in law as well. Ben Goldacre writes in his book about science that courts punish people less harshly when they harm big numbers of people. Because if you're in a court and someone's killed one person, that's much more visceral than if they injured 100,000 or killed uh, 50. <clears throat> One of my favourite examples of this is uh, from APT, a data journalism outfit um, in the UK. And they did a report on uh, Qatar construction workers in the lead up to the next World Cup. Um, <clears throat> And the way that they presented this, this again, this was hundreds of deaths. So how do you get people to engage with these numbers? Well, what they did was they used football teams um, and dead workers to essentially humanise each of those dead workers. And this worked really well on mobile because you had to scroll and scroll and scroll past all these dead people, essentially. So it was, a, again, a visceral, kind of quite physical way of experience that story. And I'm interested in these, in how visual storytelling is being used in new ways in data journalism. Again, something we can ask more questions about. Likewise, we're getting new forms of visualization. Traditionally in data journalism, we would have explanatory graphics, graphics that told us a story, broadcast graphics, if you like. But we're increasingly getting exhibitory and exploratory visualization which is less about broadcasting a story and more about users engaging with it. In my um, <coughs> Inverted Pyramid of Data Journalism, I outlined a number of different ways that you could tell stories about data. So yes, you've got visualisation, yes, you've got narration and humanising, but you can also make data social online, you can personalise it, you can make tools out of it. These are all really interesting areas as well that I'd like to see explored both journalistically and academically. The utilising area is most interesting for me because this is where if we are creating tools for users, whether that's to write to their MP, to sign a petition, to <coughs> submit an FOI request, at what point do we move from the traditional impartial role to a more advocacy role in journalism? And to what extent should we be doing that? <coughs> Then we've got robot journalism versus computational journalism. These, for me, are two names for the same thing. It is what Fackenberger would call a technological drama, two discourses competing. The thing is that a robot feels like it has its own mind, uh, whereas a computer is something that we control. And this is going to have to happen because our content is becoming increasingly connected and semantic, meaningful. This is a a text editor that the New York Times have experimented with, which identifies entities in articles and connects them with data. And of course, here's the obligatory Panama Papers, WikiLeaks series of slides about just how big of this year's data leak has been last year. So, here we go. Daniel Ellsberg took a year to photocopy the Pentagon paper. He spent $20,000 of his own money photocopying it. It wasn't just him, it was his friends and family doing this. To do the same with Bradley Manning's leaks, 
would have taken 18 years. For offshore leaks, it would have taken two phase in 1980. And for Panama Papers, 28,800 years to port a copy of those documents. I'm not doing that. We have to use computers. This is part of um, what we do. So uh, we need to get to grips with it. I know papers who can't handle anything that doesn't open in Excel. That is not good enough. This week, Mitsubishi, falsified data, Volkswagen, and so on. Um, these are going to be recurring stories. But we need to look at the software that's being used to do this. Led Manovich very rightly says that if we don't address software itself, we are in danger of only dealing with the effects of software, the outputs, rather than the causes. So that requires a new literacy of academics as well, an ability to read code, which is probably in shorter um, stock in academia than it is in Germany, particularly in humanities anyway. <coughs> Another brief issue I want to touch on is integrity. Integrity of the data and integrity of the journals. And by this I mean protection of sources. Uh, we have now an increasing number of laws that are attacking anonymity and attacking um, the ability to um, contact journalists or contact anyone without that information being made public. Freedom House's Freedom on the Net report in 2014 noted that in the previous year, 19 of 65 countries had passed new legislation that increased or restricted user anonymity. Now, protection of sources is one of the most central ethical cores of journalism. It's, it's in courts all around the world. Um, what I find really interesting is there's a lot of research about sourcing practice in journalism that's routine government sources, uh, pressure groups, and so on. But there's very little research about unconventional sources, unroutine sourcing, and the protection of that. Now, I'll talk later on, I'm, I'm presenting a paper later on about security, so I'm not going to um, talk too much about it now. Um, but we also haven't really looked at workplace monitoring either, and how ubiquitous that has become. It's very difficult to do things in a way that's not monitored. So, one piece of law that's being proposed at the moment in the UK would require organisations, including publishers, but also third parties potentially, to include fake adverts, to install malware, malware on targets, devices, um, apps that broadcast information about their users, phishing attacks, and so on. That's an attack on the integrity of journalists to some extent. How can we promise confidentiality to a source when we don't have the interest to deal with these issues? <coughs> Likewise, when you've got this sort of hacking, uh, government approved hacking taking place, how do we ensure the integrity of the information itself? Because it could have been manipulated and changed remark. <coughs> There's an issue around integrity of archives as well. How do we archive data journals and projects that are often interactive and use technologies that might be outdated and non-supported, like Flash, in 10 years' time? And that takes me on to the final point, which is about culture shifts in journalism. And this, I think, is one of the big interesting areas at the moment in terms of the change in journalism. Just over 100 years ago, journalism started to move towards a more objective model uh, and less of an adversarial um, partisan model. So we have to remember in the 19th century, most journalism was partisan. It, was, uh, it took a position. It supported a song. The rise of advertising as a business model as well as other cultural changes, facilitated a shift towards a more sitting on the fence type model, although that differs from country to country and broadcast and print. What I think we're seeing at the moment is another change of business model and a similar change in culture from um, objectivity to transparency. 
and uh, civic tech, uh, open data movements, hacktivism, these are all having an impact on this through data journalism and computational journalism. So here's BuzzFeed sharing its methods on its match-fixing investigation into tennis. Here's a map about the increase in fact-checking science. What Wilson Lowry describes as a clash of logics where journalists are now starting to take sides and fact-checking sides. They're starting to say, this is false. Which is slightly uncomfortable for some journalists, particularly US ones. <coughs> So what I've tried to do is list a whole series of what I would call white houses on the way to Shangri-La and data dystopia, of all sorts of things that we should be looking at as academics and as journalists as our whole business, our whole profession, industry changes. And because everybody likes a list, <coughs> take out your cameras now, everyone else wants all these. Um, these are my 10 questions to ask to mirror the Kovac and Rosenstiel. <laughs> uh, Kovac and Rosenstiel's um, principles. So just to summarise, how independent are we from our sources as data journalists? How do we choose the data that we use? Who has a voice in it and who doesn't? To what extent are we telling truth to power and to what extent are we reinforcing myths? What mistakes do we make in data journalism and how often and how can they be uh, prevented within certain workflows? How do we engage with our audiences through <coughs> visualisation, through activity, uh, through creating tools and personalising data and what issues? divorce raised. Not everyone likes charts that a significant minority of people are turned off by data visualisation. What can we automate and what are we automating? As soon as we uh, automate things, we codify our own practices. To some extent, we set it in stone unless you have some sort of machine learning, which itself codifies certain practices. There's some really interesting potential here for investigative journalism. Uh, I think it's Bruce Ard who did some research into the idea of um, automating, uh, looking at what should be, so what kind of policies say should be the effect of laws or what, what people should do, so tax for example, and what actually happens. So you take a set of codes embedded in law and you test that with an algorithm and look for variations from it. That's really interesting for me in terms of computational journalism. Um, how do we ensure the integrity of journalists through protecting our sources? How do we ensure the integrity of data itself that's not being hacked? How do we ensure the integrity of our archives when we're dealing with formats which may not be spotted in the future? What cultures do we have in journalism? How is that changing in the move from objectivity to transparency? Uh, with the impact of uh, hacktivism and program culture. And finally, perhaps most importantly for me, how are we holding data itself to account? Data itself has a power that results in action. That for me is the key question of the next 10 years and beyond. It's you know, our roles as journalists, not just holding the power to account, but holding the data itself, which is a power to account. And that takes us back to data and action, what we're doing in between us. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for a very rich one this in many ways. Uh, maybe one quick question here before we go to the next phase. Anyone? No quick questions? Yes, please. Hi. Uh, Clearly, there's a lot of research that suggests that's a major factor holding the back. Uh, 
Um, but I also think a lot of that's a perception problem in terms of data journalism and being resource intensive. But I don't think it has to be. But I, I think the, the opportunity with a lot of automation or com computational journalism mm -hmm. is uh, to actually save time. There's a lot of repetition in journalism which uh, is, you know, we shouldn't be doing. Um, so I think there's a lot of basic, simple data journalism that doesn't have to be investigative journalism, like I said. And there's also a lot of ways which doesn't involve doing charts or uh, big investigations, which are about just thinking, you know, computational thinking about what we do and thinking, if I'm doing something more than once, well, can I get computers to do that for me and, and do something more journalistic? Thank you, Paula. Thank, thank you for tweeting as well during the lecture. So uh, that's very clever. For example. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, we uh, uh, go next to the paper presentation. So. Um,